terms of the coaching. So now we're talking about a group of athletes who have been incredibly successful and Howard dropped some, some crazy numbers on us. Like in major league baseball, there's never been a black coach that didn't play before they became the coach. And there's only like five instances in the NBA history and, and it was similar in the NFL. That barrier to entry, and I think, you know, you've talked about this on both Bright Time, High Noon, everywhere else, that atmosphere that's been created, how much of that is the media and how much of that are the leagues and the, and the atmospheres that they're creating around these organizations? I think the media, as much as anything else, is reacting to the leagues. Like one thing I found about guys who cover sports, when it comes time to like talking about somebody getting run out of there, they don't start talking about that till somebody start talking to them about it. All right, like that's something that's something that I have figured out over the course of time. So, like I remember, um, I don't think this was the year Les Miles got fired. I think it was the year before when they were trying to fire him. Yeah, and there was a long column by whoever the like established columnist at the Baton Rouge Advocate, the newspaper down there, was about how yo, so they might fire Les Miles. And when I read that, I was like, ain't no might. They go fire Les Miles, right? right. You, did, you did not decide all by yourself that you were going to wake up and say, I think that they should fire Les Miles. Somebody lets you know, we think about firing Les Miles, and you might want to let the folks know and see how it plays, right? That, right? that happens a lot. That's the way that goes. So, like, the thing I always try to explain to people, though, when it comes to coaches is, you give me at the end of any season, if the league got 30 teams, I can make an argument for firing 25 coaches every single year. If yeah. you want to fire somebody, coming up with a reason to fire them isn't hard, and getting people to go along with it isn't hard either. You can, you can right. come up with it real quick if you decide that that is what you want to do. And I think that that by and large starts with teams. Now, I think the media easily jumps on it because it plays into the same biases that they already possess when they go into this, right? Like one thing you ain't gonna have that many, that many people in media who are the ones like trying to explain why the black guy should actually get to keep his job. Peer pressure is real. <laughs> you know, right, like, like right. these, these, these are things they matter. They're large. They're, 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 they're bigger than just like the individual interactions. And so I think the media bears the responsibility for not pushing back on some of these things, but the right. genesis of the environment that's coming from the teams and the league. Yeah. And do you think, I mean, I know in, in, Baseball is 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 an extreme, but do you think there's some there there's some higher out there? Do you think that there's a moment? You know, when I was in college, and I and his name is is escaping me, but when Notre Dame hired the black football, Tyrone coach, Willingham, like we felt like I, I don't know. Even as a young player, I was like, oh man, this might be it. Like we're getting through the getting through the thick of it, you know, because I think Notre Dame was like the last place right, in my right. mind, particularly as a young person that would hire a black coach. Right. So do you think that, you know, do you think that there's a, a, a point where we get to finally, if there, if, if there is a hire, right. If there's someone that we could, that, that gets hired, that gets like the Dallas Cowboys, for instance. Right. Right. Or the Yankees, for instance, you know what we need. I think this will be the closest thing to making it happen to me. If they hire some brother that ain't got no business getting the job in the first place and then he turns out to be successful, right? Maybe that'll be the thing. Of course, that first part will never happen, right? Right, 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 right. <laughs> the, 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 you ain't got no business getting this job. It's very, very unlikely to happen. But right. maybe that's the like maybe that's the thing that kind of like that kind of tips it over and makes people like kind of shake off. Cause you have to be like such an optimal candidate to get a job as a black person in the first right. place. And then if you don't do well, they're like, damn, we went and got the best black dude we could ever find. And he couldn't, right, even, right, right. You know, he couldn't even get the job done, right? right, and, right, and right. After that happens, the next guy, there's always a measure of overcorrection, right? So Willingham got fired after three years, the only coach Notre Dame ever had who didn't get to work out his first full five-year contract. Charlie Weiss then got a 10-year contract extension based off a loss the right. year after they fired him. Like, y'all, like, like, nobody's reading the room here? Right. No, no, nobody's nobody's peeping game on what exactly it is that you're doing. And just so many of these cats feel like they don't have to treat us right. And right. in the end, media does not. And this is where I blame media. Media does not force anybody to treat us right. Media does not right. push these things. We have the same Rooney rule. I sure wish these guys would start acting right instead of demanding that they act right in the first place. Right. Right. Wow. Yeah. It blows my mind that the enemy doesn't have a job right now. Yeah. Like that one. Everybody that's worked that job under Andy Reid is going to got another job. Like yeah. this is this is a sure bet that somebody goes and gives you a head coach a job. And I'll be fair, I I'm careful about these things because I never know what's happening, right? So I know about right. one dude in the NBA who year after year after year you would hear, 
why hasn't somebody hired this guy to be a head coach? He was an assistant at the time and fairly visible year mm-hmm. after year after year. Man, then I talked to some people, and, you know, and it's black people too, just to be clear. And they were like, yo, man, he showed up in here unprepared. Like, right. he, you know, and so I only bring that up not to be like black people be unprepared. No, but sometimes there is a reason why that one dude isn't getting the job. It doesn't work. Now, right, it, right, it right. ain't the reason why everybody ain't getting no job. But I am very wary of going to the wall on these cats I don't know. And then they'd be right. like, yo, come here, let me talk to you for a second. Right. Is there is there a correlation um with black coaches? Uh, we had a conversation with Baron Davis and he, you know, he talked to us about how when uh, we were together for a few months before he was traded, uh, this was my second year in New Orleans when Byron Scott became the head coach. And Barron admitted later, right, that he had an issue relating to a black coach. And it really? was something that, yeah, it took him some time to 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 realize, right, to be mature enough to recognize. But, I, you know, I, I've experienced that as well, um, because you go through these this moment where you don't. So white power in the sense of a white person being in control of something is something that's reinforced in society on a daily basis, right? The police chief, the principal of the school, the dean, the pro everybody, right? Then you come into the environment of sports and your coach is black. And it is, there's a, there's a, a part of you that says, and it's a part of you that is dark for us. It's, does this know what he's talking about? Like we question, yeah. Right. And that that part to me is something that I had to I had to learn, figure out. But you almost have to you almost have to work through that. And I think yes, that yes. that that has that has implications with how that coach presents himself. So you've got you've got someone like Avery Johnson right. who right. picked up the name, the nickname Slavery Johnson because he worked his guys to death. Yeah, right. Yeah. B Scott was the same way with us. He worked us to death. But it was like I felt like at times coach had to separate like I'm. Yeah, these are my guys, but I'll kick their ass if they, right, you know, right. so. And then there are other guys who, you know, they say, well, he can't be hired because he's going to be too comfortable with the players. He's not going to hold them accountable. And I feel like black coaches are in this weird. Right. What are you? Yeah. It's like this right. weird mix. They try to find themselves in. Yeah, so Avery is an interesting case because I I I don't even know Avery personally, but I know why Avery is the way Avery is. Avery five foot ten from New Orleans, Louisiana, <laughs> right. right? Which is right, so right, like right. you. He's like, do you have any clue what I had to do to get here? I don't think <laughs> yeah, you yeah. like Scott Skiles was the same way, right? And Scott right. Skiles was a much better player, like as a college guy. You know, he was right. always touted, but they had to grind so hard to get it that they have a hard time with anybody who doesn't grind as hard that way. As right. Because they, right? Right? they right. just like, yo, this is what you do to get to the NBA. But I think we all grow up in the same society. So we means that we also grow up with the same racism and the same stuff. And we, right. we as black people also take in a lot of the stuff that white people take in. And a lot of those subconscious biases and everything else, you don't realize it's happened until it's tested. You know, right. and so Barron is interesting when you say that because Barron, if I'm not mistaken, Barron went to like the 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 artsy uh, magnet high school, Crossroads, yeah. right? He's like he right. went to high school with like Jessica Alba. Like I know people that right. went there. Right. I, I, I bet his coach there wasn't black, right? right. And so, you know, <laughs> and, then, and then you go to UCLA and you're right. in that space. And I could until he probably had never even thought about it to the moment he said it to himself. Where he's like, "Yo." What this dude know? And keep in mind, Barrett Davis is a dude from Los Angeles, and Byron Scott right. is a Showtime Laker. Right. And I'm not throwing any shade at Barron for this, to be clear. But I'm just right, saying right. that that's how powerful the forces are. Exactly. That, you know exactly. that that are on top of us. And I do think that a lot of times people look at themselves and say, "Well, what does he even know?" When in reality, you should be saying to yourself, "Do you have any clue what he had to do to, do get, to get here?" here. I right. don't think you do. Hey, let me tell you, man, they ain't giving us a whole lot of jobs we ain't qualified for. Right, like it can right. happen sometimes, right. but not a lot. <laughs> right, right, right. And that, I mean, I had to learn that. I, I really did, man. That I mean, that what you said speaks true because that's something that is for all the the, the knowledge that I claim and 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 proud that I've accumulated over the years. Like that's something that I'm standing there, like, damn, am I really doing this? Like, am I really? You know, it's like the first time we see again. The first time we see black pilots, we like, oh shit. Like I, yes. I'm telling you, it's a, it's it. It was for me. I get on the airplane and I turn around. And I'm like, oh, all right, stop it, David. That brother can do exactly what he needs to do, just like anybody else. But it's like we, again, we become 
you know, we, we, get, we become a part of what we see as well. What, what is being pushed in society, we embrace it. We, and it becomes a part of our subconscious, even though we don't, we don't realize it. And let me tell you, man, that's where I got lucky myself personally growing up in HBCU world. Right. Right. Because all these people that had all these positions of authority and power and everything else were all black. Right. right. Like the idea that like those things are things that black people shouldn't do and places where black people aren't never part of my life. Right. N- never at any point in my life. Right. You know, and, and I but I do think for a lot of people, if you've never seen it and you've never been around it, you just don't realize how much of this stuff that we ultimately take in. Like I've had the good fortune of it's been a while since I did this, but like working with for myself personally, working with young white college students. It take them a while to believe that like somebody like me exists. Right. Like you imagine that you're a freshman in college and 23, 24 year old me walks in teaching the class. Right. And I'm kicking right. it like I kick it. Right. Like I'm not right, coming right. in here with like a jacket with with elbow patches and all right, that right. stuff. Right? <laughs> right. I look like one of these dudes that you see on the yard or that you see on the street or whatever it is. I look right. like them in a lot of ways. I sound like them. But then I start talking about the stuff we're talking about. And now they're trying to figure out like none of this fits. Right. The right. black dude is not supposed to be the smart guy. And if the black dude is supposed to be the smart guy, he's not supposed to look like the other black dudes. Right. Like right, I went right, to high right. school with a black dude that was the smart guy. And that right. was what he did. <laughs> like all of this. And so I would find myself and I had the patience going in because I recognized, hey, man, uh, the Tupac lied. I was given this world. I didn't make it. Right. Like right, they right. taking in all of this stuff. And it would be really interesting to hear the things that they would say kind of about black people that they didn't even know they were saying because it's so right. common. It's just part of what everything is. Like when somebody will say something about um, like every college, every black quarterback that comes around, you got to ask yourself whether they qualify to read a defense. They never ask that question about white people ever. Right. Right. And so I would hear these things from them young and just hit them back with a simple question. And they're like, wow, you know, I hadn't even really thought about that. Right. Black folks do the same thing, man. We right. have the same exact place in this. And I don't blame them because, again, I don't blame them anymore. And I blame white people because you can't fight it off until you know there's an enemy to fight. Right. Yeah. I, I, it took me a while. Um, as polarizing as my like my childhood was and sort of coming into consciousness early. But then I never I never intermixed the worlds. So it was like, OK, what's what's going on in the in the world isn't the same as what's going on in the basketball environment. Right. We do. This is a part where we I ask two questions. They're really simple questions. Um, more of the more life questions. But yep. the first one, um, you know, I think we're literally the same age. So we kind of got this world the same. The whole mindfulness routine, being strategic with your mornings. Right. So I always like to ask people, like, what is it that you do in the morning? Like, what is your if you have one, what is your the first thing you do, your morning routine, um, that 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 sort of sets your day in motion. Yo, I have I've I've never like been great at that, but now that this stuff has happened, I'm doing yoga now, man. I get up, uh, okay. try to get up sometime at seven o'clock hour, get about 15, 20 minutes of yoga in. Like that that for me is a big one. Um that I get done. When we were doing the TV show, I'd get up, check over what we had to do for that, think about it in the shower, get out, get dressed, like do a conference call and then go from there. But now trying to, you know, treating this beard like a beard, trying to get my body right, you know, right, get right, a stretch right. all the start of the day. <laughs> and I got to say, I, everything everybody always said about yoga, like I don't get all high-minded and metaphysical about this stuff, but I see why other people do. I recommend it. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, that's a that's a good a good thing because like for me, it was hard. It was always, my life was always centered around basketball. So I'm always looking at the phone, the alarm, got to get up. Gotta, now that I don't have basketball, I've kind of had to figure out like a morning routine, yes. you know, figuring out like, how do I get my day started? It helps that I've got a one-year-old, but oh, yeah. <laughs> aside from that, you know, it's just a figuring out, you know, certain things to, hey, uh, first, to get week after quor- first week after quarantine, I was lost. I didn't have the things that structured my day. Like my day was structured around a schedule that was right. externally generated. After that, man, I was like, yo, man, like, why am I not in the shower yet? Like, right. what, what am I doing? Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yes, I, I've, I've enjoyed your tweets about like, hey, I showered before noon. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm getting there now, though, man. It make a difference, I'm telling you. Right, right, right. We, the, the other question is about failure. And, you know, I've had a failed up moment in my um, in my life. You know, I was I was supposed to graduate high school in 98, didn't because of my grades, because I 
basically ignored school as a freshman, couldn't walk with my class. So I had to flunk out of school, take an extra year of military school to graduate high school. And that was a really hard thing to do. Um, but I always sort of contextualize it as a fail up moment for me where I, 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 I reached this moment in my life where I failed, right? I didn't accomplish this, this thing of graduating high school with my class. And it was really awkward telling people, yeah, man, I'm not going to graduate, but you're the start a basketball team. Yeah, but I'm not going to graduate. Um, and it was that moment though, for me that like shifted, like I, I no longer wanted to be viewed as I was like, yo, you can't put too much in this basketball stuff. Cause it affects everything else. Right. Um, you know, people calling me big dummy, um, and stuff like that. And so it was a fail up moment for me where I felt like that was my lowest. And then everything from that moment on, because of my sort of re, I kind of got restructured in the sense that I needed to take care of myself better. I needed to do what I needed to do with my responsibility list, right. Dedicating myself to the game and all the attributes around the game. So where in your life, at what moment? I mean, you've you've achieved a lot. You've gone through, uh, you know, the corporate world. You talked about you were teaching early on. Where in your life did you have a a fail up moment? Oh man, I'm having a hard time picking just one to be honest. Okay. <laughs> um, when I flunked out of graduate school, that's a big one. Um, right. Like, I mean, the idea that I would flunk out of anything, nobody had ever considered anything like that, right, man? That shit was right. hard. Uh, it was hard, and I didn't work hard enough, and I had to recalibrate. That's when I threw myself wholly into doing media stuff. Um, right. And I went from there, and I got a contract to be a columnist at ESPN.com's page two in 2006. So, you know, this is like the, the, the Bill Simmons, David Halberstam, Ralph Wiley. Like, I mean, Halberstam right, and right. Wiley, I think it passed away by then. But it was like, I mean, it was heavy hitters, and I was one of them. And I had the contract for a year. And then they didn't renew it. And then after that happened, I started doing radio and I got it was taken off. And then the radio station went out of business. And then All I right. got another radio job. And then the radio station went out of business. And then I did the different TV stuff for ESPN. And honestly, I think I'm in one right now. Right. Like they canceled the TV show. It happens. It ain't, you know, these, right. these things happen in the business. But I'm in a period right now where after that happened and with the quarantine, I really said to myself, but I need to recalibrate and what I need to do more than anything else. It's almost like you hear about the rappers who've been like, I moved back into projects for my last album. Right. Like right. I had that, I got that hunger again. Right. right, I, to right. I totally understand it now. Right. Like I'm right, right. writing YouTube videos that we're doing, um, you know, just getting on wherever I can get on doing podcasts and stuff. Cause now is the time. There's no reason for me not to work hard right now, just cause something didn't go right. You right. Know? And so right. I found that for myself, I have not had any one of these moments that's hit me. And it's made me want to quit. It's made me realize I maybe needed to do something else. But it's told right. me, however hard I was working, I probably needed to work a little harder. So one other, Bamani, in terms of a positive outlook, once this is all over and we have the, the go ahead from medical professionals and not some other folks uh, to go back outside in a safe way, what are you most looking forward to doing? Man, that is a very good question. I feel like I, I, I feel like we took restaurants for granted. Right. The idea that somebody will cook my food, bring my food, pick up my plate and even refill my drink. I got to do all that shit now. Right. Every single bit of it. Right. right. I, I, I forgot what it was like to have somebody like, you know, like I got trips and stuff I would like to take. I don't know how long it's going to be before I get on a plane or go to one yeah. of these other countries where they may not accept my insurance. Right. Like, I don't right, know. Right. I, I don't know what that's going to be. But I think that we are going to be so excited just to be sitting down at a restaurant. Right. Yeah, that's a good one. It definitely is. So, yeah. well, Bamani, it's been uh, a lot of fun. Thank you again for agreeing to join us. And that's a wrap on this episode of Forward Thinking. All right, man. I appreciate you having me. 